Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Luke Nguyen. I am Professor of Political Science at the University of Toronto and co-director of the Petro Yatsik Program for the Study of Ukraine. As all of you know, it's uh, been one year since Russia's uh, full-scale invasion of Ukraine. This is a conflict that has uh, wrought unimaginable horror uh, about um, thousands of civilian deaths, about 100,000 Ukrainians killed or wounded, um, and about 8 million uh, Ukrainian refugees in Europe. But also it's been awful on the Russian side. You've had about 200,000 casualties in the Russian army. Uh, this is about four times or more, more than, than occurred over a single decade in, in Afghanistan in the 1980s. You've had hundreds of thousands of the smartest people in, in Russia flee the country and a dramatic loss of Russia's geopolitical power. At the start of the war, Russia had its tentacles in the elite of Western Europe. It had you know, strong influence across the former, former Soviet space. Now Europe has basically you know, broken economic ties more or less with Russia. And uh, Russia is no longer really as much of a player as it used to be in places like Central Asia and the Caucasus. So discuss uh, you know, and summarize what's been going on in the last year. Um, and where it's headed in the future, we have four experts, esteemed experts. The first um, is Oksana Hus, who's a researcher at the BIT Act Research Project at the University of Bologna. She was a former Petro Yatsik fellow here at the University of Toronto. Um, her expertise is in anti-corruption, and she also just wrote a re fun, really wonderful paper on the role of decentralization in the Ukrainian response to the Russian invasion. Next on the Ukrainian side, we have Petro Burkowski, who's the executive director of the Ilko Kucherev Democratic Initiatives Fund. Um, he's an expert uh, on disinformation uh, in, the, in, in Russia and Ukraine. Um, he's also a non-resident fellow at the Petro Yatsik program. Um, and he can, I should just mention something about DIFF. Um, DIFF, for those of you who do not know, has produced wonderful um, data um, on, you know, on the Euro Maidan and many other things. It's been very useful to those of us who study Ukraine. Next, um, we have Konstantin Sonin. Professor Sonin is the John Dewey uh, Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago. He studied political economy, uh, development, and economics. Um, he was actually in Moscow. Uh, during the uh, invasion in February 24th, and I'll talk to him about that. Um, he's been a, a very strong supporter of Ukraine and written many op-eds on the conflict. And finally, we have Professor Yuri Zhukov, who um, by, the, by his name um, is almost certainly a military expert. Uh, you forget Yuri, I'm sure I've asked you this and many people have, you're not related to the Zhukov? No, okay, sorry. Um, He's an associate professor of political science at the University of Michigan, and he's written really wonderful, uh, you know, data-driven papers on the terror and uh, the, the war in Ukraine. Uh, so without further ado, I think we'll start. Um, first, I want to kind of start with the uh, Ukrainian side. Um, so on the morning of February 21st, 4th, I think many, when Russia engaged in the invasion, I think many of us were quite pessimistic. Um, Certainly the Western experts did not expect um, uh, Ukraine to resist the invasion very successfully, but also many in Ukraine, as evidenced by, you know, the traffic jams outside, you know, trying to leave Kiev, many people were certainly very pessimistic. But as, as all of you know, um, things turned out very differently. And Ukraine, um, you know, put up a much stronger resistance. And in fact, sort of Putin very quickly had to abandon his original war aims. Um, so i just get you, uh, Oksana and Petro, to talk about this. I'll start with you, Oksana. Uh, you know, why, generally speaking, you know, why do you think Ukraine did so much better than many um, expected? Thanks, Lucan, for this question. Um, indeed, that was uh, surprising. I observed the uh, events from Germany and in Germany, there was this perception how things can work under conditions of war in the first days uh, as you said here also people were very pessimistic 
But even later on, there was always this assumption and premise in the discussions, uh, do politics and institutions function? Does everything work? And um, to answer this question, we conducted this survey with uh, local public authorities in Ukraine. That was a survey uh, by the uh, Council of Europe, Congress of Local and Regional Authorities. And uh, in the numbers, I was surprised by two things. So first, that was um, not only functioning of the state, because uh, local authorities, uh, three quarter of those who uh, replied to the survey, they mentioned that uh, they were able to provide um, almost in a full extent the administrative services. And they were also uh, having uh, council meetings. So it's not only that they continued functioning, but also that they uh, preserved democratic way of decision-making. Uh, what's exceptional about it, that under conditions of martial law, mayors, they were allowed, for example, to do one person decisions. And nevertheless, uh, over 80% over of local authorities, they were relying on the council meetings that were going on uh, in the first three months in 80% of uh, local public authorities, which is quite impressive under uh, all shellings and uh, security risks. And also they relied on the decisions, uh, collective decisions of the executive committee. So this kind of not only uh, maintaining functioning, but also being democratic, that was surprising. And the question why um, of course, the civil society in Ukraine is very vibrant and played a huge role that people engaged. The whole nation was, in fact, engaged in uh, providing support to the army, to the internally displaced people, IDPs, to support somehow um, the functioning of the society. Again, what was surprising about that or exceptional, that there were channels in place to channelize these activities and not to lend them in a chaos, but to bring some um, public value out of this engagement. And uh, in our survey, we saw that there were three major conditions leading to that. So one was the uh, reform on, of decentralization that took place between 2015 and 2020. Uh, in fact, uh, it gave to local authorities more political power, but also um, funds and resources to decide about education, about healthcare, uh, social services, so that people, they were able to uh, decide their issues, administrative issues on the local level, but also that there were practices of citizen engagement evolving in Ukraine very much, especially after the Maidan revolution. And these were like, for example, participatory budgeting or uh, public consultations. Participatory budgeting is particularly interesting because local authorities, they, they were not obliged to introduce this practice, but it was their voluntary decision that they give a part of their budget to citizens so that citizens decide on themselves, like for example, two or 3% of the budget uh, of uh, local authority, what to do with that. So to do a playground or whatsoever. And um, in our survey, for example, every third respondent indicated that this practice was critical for um, resolving problems and challenges of the war. Although there was no participatory budgeting in the war. Why was it crucial? Because there were networks and communication channels created during these practices within a five years where local authorities learned to uh, work with citizens and other stakeholders like businesses. Mm -hmm. And the third thing is, of course, the digital transformation and the use of uh, digital tools that was booming in Ukraine uh, that enabled all the coordination between authorities and citizens to channelize all the activism in something proper. Okay, great. So basically what you're saying is that sort of, sort of society was basically ready to respond regardless of sort of, in a sense, or not so much dependent on what was going on at the top. Uh, Petro, I want to turn it to you. I mean, so we've learned that sort of the FSB in Russia 
uh, conducted a number of surveys of, of Ukrainians. Um, and whatever they found, they found encouraging. They thought that, you know, because of uh, um, disaffection with um, with Zelensky and the like, they they sort of saw what they felt was, you know, sort of a, a vulnerable Ukraine sort of that would, would not resist heavily um, to a Russian invasion. Um, in a broad strokes, like why, why do you think they were so wrong? Uh, thank you. <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, I first, I don't think that they were very wrong. I think that, uh, and uh, just explain as a scholar uh, who is in Ukraine and who studies uh, public opinion and Russian influence since 2006, just to add to uh, also, to, I, I should say that I worked as a civil servant at the National Institute for Strategic Studies uh, since 2006 until uh, 2020. So it's a think tank under the president of Ukraine. And uh, we worked uh, with open and classified information about uh, domestic situation and the foreign influences, both Russian and Western in Ukraine, and uh, suggesting a uh, political advice for the National Security and Defense Council and the president of Ukraine. And uh, um, well, what I can say you that uh, definitely the Russian intelligence uh, worked through uh, the political forces, political parties that uh, were well, that were loyal to Russia, and I think they did they did uh, conducted uh, uh, surveys uh, about the situation in Ukraine, and the uh, the year of 2021 was uh, uh, quite. Uh, um, Quite it was quite difficult for Ukraine, uh, especially uh, the last six months, because uh, so the Russian invasion started uh, in the late uh, February, uh, and uh, if you look back, uh, the October and November, they're the months when the Ukrainian healthcare system collapsed. It completely collapsed. People were dying uh, uh, without oxygen, without proper healthcare, uh, in hundreds in hundreds uh, and uh, uh, the government uh, and people were very dissatisfied with the government how it was managed uh, and uh, you know in December uh, 2021 when we asked an open question it, is, it was an open question to you to the citizens to the respondents that was a nationwide opinion poll to thousand respondents in all the regions and the statistics was very very accurate it's not like after the war of course and uh, there are 45 percent of ukrainians in december they said that uh, it's an open-ended question so they gave their own answer the question was uh, uh whom consider the biggest disappointment of the year and the 45 percent they said uh, president zelensky so you could imagine a great dissatisfaction with the authority uh, um, and I think Russians did understand this. Uh, next, uh, uh, they, uh, uh, they saw uh, the great dissatisfaction of people that people were dissatisfied how COVID Delta wave was managed. Uh, then uh, people observed uh, a numerous um, clashes between Zelensky and uh, uh, his uh, key opponent Petro Poroshenko. And uh, I just want to explain the context, maybe to the foreigners who don't know, that uh, Petro Poroshenko and his party, they were claiming that uh, attack is imminent and that the president should prepare and order uh, a mobilization. Actually, they called for mobilization. Uh, the nationalists group, like Azov movement, for instance, like uh, uh, right sector or uh, the volunteer, they called the volunteer Ukrainian uh, army or volunteer Ukrainian corps. They even, uh, and Svoboda party, they uh, started uh, preparing contingency plans how to evacuate their members if the territories are possessed by, uh, if occupied by Russians. At the moment, they, in December, they opened a courses, uh, it's uh, to translate in, in Ukrainian, it's don't afraid, uh, be prepared. Uh, don't panic, be prepared. Uh, so they trained uh, tactical uh, meds, uh, medical uh, skills, basic uh, combat skills, use of the firearms and uh, uh, civil uh, defense uh, basics. 
and uh, and so why I'm talking to you, uh, we are uh, this uh, this summer last last summer, uh, 2022, we conducted uh, and a survey uh, among the uh, nationalist volunteer groups, and they so they said that uh, according to their estimates, uh, um, it's just one Azov movement, no less than 10,000 people in December and January and in the beginning of February were able to take to took to take these courses, right? Most of them. Uh, and they were the most uh, popular in Kyiv, right? Just I uh, just three cities, and I uh, want you to pay attention. What are what they are the cities? Kyiv, Kharkiv, and Mariupol. They said they are the most successful, right? The biggest number of people came there, uh, and to me this explains why Russians were so uh, mm, unsuccessful while besieging, trying to besiege Kyiv, while besieging Kharkiv and uh, besieging Mariupol. So these civilians, they joined, then Russians attacked, they joined uh, troops and they helped a lot uh, to, uh, during this war. Uh, uh, the next point, why I'm thinking that Russians were, were not very bad in observing the Ukrainian society. Uh, first, uh, uh, there is a kind of myth, right? Which is circulating in the Western media, uh, and I uh, met it a lot. It's said that Russians uh, miscalculated because they expected that they will be uh, mm, celebrated as, uh, mm, how to say, as liberators, right? That that miscalculated that they will be met with the flowers, and instead they will be they were met with the flamethrowers and with uh, Molotov cocktails. Uh, but uh, what uh, what I can tell you uh, in reality. I don't think that uh, Russians uh, were so stupid because from the very first days of invasion, what they did, they have lists, just yeah, you, you should imagine how they were prepared. Uh, while, uh, in the very first day when they occupied the Ukrainian cities like Kherson or cities in the south of Ukraine, it's uh, Kherson and Zaporizhia region, they have the lists of the people, former uh, veterans, of uh, mm, uh, war in Donbass, they have the lists of the pro of the uh, civil activists, right from different NGOs and uh, uh, civil society organizations. They start arrest them and kill, torture and kill them massively. From the very first days, they use the tactics of uh, mock executions to terrify people and to coerce them into a cooperation, into collaboration. Uh, I, um, there was even a report made by Romatsky Radio, a, a very wonderful report by a survivor from Kherson uh, who went uh, through torture, through mock execution, and who was correct, coerced to cooperate as an admin, uh, administrator of the um, Telegram channel uh, to, uh, to, dis redis to distribute Russian propaganda in the occupied Kherson and try to distribute this propaganda into the uh, besieged uh, Mykolaiv. So they forcing people from the very first day. So that, that, that means that means they were not, they had no illusions. And from the very first day, they used the tactics of massive terror, like a ter terror politics, like this in the same way, in the very same way, uh, how they did in Ukraine in uh, 19, uh, uh, 17, 1921, then Bolsheviks came to Ukraine and uh, uh, crushed the Ukrainian Revolution of 1917. D they did the same when they um, occupied the Western Ukraine in 1938 and uh, when they occupied for the second time in 1944. The same tactics of mass terror, coerce and intimidation. Uh, and of course, uh, they were trying to enroll as much people as possible uh, as collaborators uh, to uh, run the things. And here they, uh, uh, here they really miscalculated because uh, the number of people was very low uh, who were ready to, to work as a collaborators. Uh, again, uh, if you speak about the factors which influence the uh, um, Ukrainian response, and uh, as, you said, as you asked Oksana about Ukrainian resilience, uh, before the war, we also conducted uh, two polls. Uh, in December 2021 and in February, uh, so we just ended uh, 12 days before the invasion, and we had a we published these results on uh, February 2022. So, and in both polls, we have a question: So, what are you going to do if Russians invade? 
and uh, uh, several answers you uh, uh, responded could give only one answer uh, join the regular army join the volunteer units or help ukraine uh, forces in some other way non-military non-lethal way like donors providing money help etc etc transport etc and there are, uh, and there are also a number of uh, other options just leave the country as soon as possible i will do nothing i will just try to survive uh, and i don't know uh etc cetera, etc cetera. um uh, I, I just want to uh for you to understand uh the numbers uh while um i was uh, like designing this question i took the um, the hypothesis from the uh book written by the swiss uh, swiss uh, kennel guns von dach uh which called the total uh, resistance right and uh, in his book, uh, he was writing about the Swiss, Swiss society. He said that in case of invasion, only only 20% of our society would resist actively or passively. Just 20% have no illusion. So no more. And I have this uh, idea in mind. So whether we will have this 20% in total and the results which we got in December 2021 were, were remarkable. Uh, 19% of the people said that they will join either regular or volunteer arms, uh, armed forces. That means they are, they are ready to kill and die for Ukraine. And 25% said that they are ready to uh, help uh, army in the past away. So it's uh, 43%. So it's two times more than Hans von Dach. So again, and it, it was kind of a booster for us. So we are not desperate and Russians will have very, very difficult time if they invade. Yes. And just, uh, I, I'm adding, just 10 days before the invasion, uh, the number was uh, 48%. So 22% said will join army and 25 they are going to help. So, uh, and this spoke, uh, this spoke for, uh, for itself. Great, Thank thanks. You. Um, so Yuri, uh, what's your perspective um, on... Uh on the, the sort of surprising and in, in broad stroke terms, um, this the surprising success of the Ukrainian side. On the battlefield, you mean? Yeah. Yeah, well, well, I think throughout the war, uh, the most successful offensive operations on, on each side have been in situations where uh, the defenses have been relatively thin on the ground. And this was certainly the case in, in Kharkiv. September, the Ukrainian forces took advantage of a very weak and poorly defended uh, position on the Russian side, uh, while the Russian command was focusing its attentions elsewhere. Uh, but unfortunately, in places where the Russian defenses have been more prepared, um, Ukraine's progress has slowed, um, so particularly over the last four months, uh, as the effects of mobilization have kicked in. Russia's defenses throughout the South have been bolstered by mobilized personnel. They've been building fortifications everywhere. Uh, if you think about the requirements for defensive operations, I mean, if we think about the need to punch holes through enemy lines, probably in sectors where their enemy defenses are thin, maneuver with armored vehicles, exploit these breakthroughs, carry out encirclements, and force the enemy to choose between rapid retreats and catastrophic envelopments, um, that wasn't really even the case even in, in Kherson, uh, where Ukraine managed to cut Russia off from reinforcements by taking, taking out the Antonov Bridge. This made sure that the forward positions on the Russian side cannot be sustained, uh, but Russian defenses in that sector were not thin. Uh, they actually managed to slow down uh, uh, the Ukrainians long enough to give themselves time for an or organized withdrawal. And at this stage, um, the situation is that Ukraine has fewer options to make uh, further advances, uh, certainly around Kherson, it requires either forcing a river crossing or sweeping down from further east uh, around Zaporizhia. Um, and the Russians have been reinforcing this sector of the front for months. Um, and also, Ukraine had taken pretty heavy losses during during those two uh, counteroffensives. There's a lot we do not know about losses on the Ukrainian side. OPSEC has been much better on the Ukrainian side than on the Russian side. Uh, but they do need time to re recover and rebuild. So I think if we look forward the next few months, um, there are both opportunities and risk for Ukraine. They're going to receive a lot more armored vehicles, including Challengers, Leopards, um, Abrams, uh, they're going to get infantry vehicles, new air defense systems, so long range strike systems like ATACMS, the Army Tactical Missile System. Uh, but this will not be instantaneous. And in my view, this will, they'll probably need a lot more because um, it will take many months for these systems to have a major impact. They need to be delivered. Crews need to be trained on them. 
Uh, Ukraine is also operating with pretty restrictive rules of engagement uh, that the U.S. has imposed on them. Um, Russia is allowed to strike critical infrastructure within Ukraine. Ukraine is not allowed to do the same for Russia. And, yeah, it, and, and what this means uh, in the meantime is that Ukraine will have this challenge of holding the line against the Russian winter offensive. Um, and even if this offensive does not result in major territorial gains, and I think there are good reasons to doubt that it will, um, it can still have the effect of exhausting Ukraine's forces, uh, forcing them to use up ammunition at a much faster rate than they can replace it. Ukraine right now is estimated to be firing more than 5,000 artillery rounds per day. Uh, this puts a huge strain on the defense industry, uh, both in Europe and the U.S., uh, compound supply challenges, I think. As far as the U.S. goes, we need serious defense industrial mobilization. We need to invoke the Defense Production Act. Uh, we need to ramp up ammunition production much more significantly and give the industry multi-year contracts so they can make the needed investments. I think there's an under underestimation on the U.S. side, and especially in Europe, to what this will take uh, to give Ukraine what it needs to win. Uh, in the meantime, even if the Russian winter offensive kind of grinds to a halt, uh, as it very well may, um, they can still be quite successful in forcing uh, uh, the Ukrainians to use up a lot of their ammunition and also to kill thousands of Ukrainian personnel that could be useful in the potential counteroffensive. Uh, so the opportunity cost is high. Um, yeah, so, so that's where we, where we basically are right now. The Russians are, their winter offensive has been ongoing for several weeks now. Um, it's been mainly limited to the Donbass. Uh, the concept of operations seems to be this double envelopment of Ukrainian forces uh, from the northeast, coming in from uh, Krimina, uh, and from the south, from Bugledar. Um, meanwhile, pinning down Ukrainian forces around Bakhmut and uh, Avdiivka. Uh, and taking up defensive positions elsewhere, all, all along the, the southern front uh, in Zaporizhia. Uh, some possible diversionary actions in Kharkiv and Sumy uh, uh, to spread Ukrainian defenses thin. Um, I think the, the likelihood of something coming down from Belarus to toward Kiev is fairly remote, uh, particularly on a, on, a, on a large scale. Um, but we should expect to continue to see this intensified use of aviation to exhaust uh, Ukrainian anti-air defenses. Uh, but the main effort is still around the, the spot of a Krimina line in Luhansk Oblast, which uh, sits on critical ground lines of communications around there. And they're attempting to break through the Ukrainian lines, but I, I think we're unlikely to see a huge expansion of this effort because the absolute majority of the Russian military is already committed. Uh, to this fight. Uh, they have committed a large majority of the Western military district's uh, conventional uh, elements uh, to the Svat of a criminal line. Uh, most of the available maneuver elements of the other military districts uh, and the VDV uh, airborne forces uh, are also committed. And right now, Russia just does not have enough uh, uncommitted reserves to dramatically increase the scale or intensity of this offensive. Um, so I just want to follow up. Um, I mean, I, I think, um, you know, I mean, from what you're saying, it, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, it sort of sounds like you're kind of predicting kind of a, you know, more of a kind of a freezing of the lines of conflict. Um, at the same time, um, in, in the spring um, and summer, I think many also expected, you know, non-military experts like myself kind of expected the sort of lines of conflict to remain fairly stable. But of course, thankfully, that did not happen with the, you know, Kharkiv offensive and the, and the offensive in the South. So how is it different you know, if, if our expectations in the in the late spring and summer were wrong about Ukrainian success, um, and you know, why aren't you going to be wrong? Why are you going to be wrong this time? You know, what you know, or well, how is it different, or is it different? Or I guess. Yeah, well, I mean, a, a lot depends on, uh, I suppose, the success of a Russian Muskirovka, uh, unless they're hiding a lot of reserves that we cannot s see through uh, through remote sensing. Um, what they have committed to the theater is pretty much what's there. And, and, and a lot of the reason for this is because of the heavy losses that they took um, during uh, the early days of the war, uh, particularly the tank units. Because um, if you think about R Russian, Russians right now have a numerical advantage that they did not have early in the war. Uh, that is one way in which, uh, which things have changed. And, but this mobilized manpower that they have um, they're using that to, to reconstitute existing uh, maneuver regiments, um, 
but there's little evidence that they have had enough time to train this mobilize, these mobilized reservists to the standards needed to support large-scale offensive maneuver warfare. Uh, mobilized personnel are good for holding the line and rear duties like building these fortifications, but what they currently lack is, well, replacements for all the lost tanks from the earlier stage in the war. Russia lost between a third and a half of its pre-war tank fleet in the first year of the war, lost three times as many vehicles as Ukraine. Um, a lot of that is due to the fact that they were moving these tanks and these long columns without combat air support, without protection from infantry, allowed Ukrainian anti-tank anti crews to get up close. Uh, there was also a design flaw that was discovered in Russian tanks uh, that meant a single incoming anti-tank round could explode the ammunition stores, blow off the turret. Uh, over a thousand Russian tanks have been disabled and 500 have been captured by the Ukrainians. Um, and rebuilding entire tank regiments from scratch requires hundreds of tanks that Russia does not have in usable condition and are not able to produce quickly enough to replace these losses. And the amount they can produce in their term is a fraction of what they're losing. Uh, what this means for offensive operations uh, and the way that this is different from, from the early stages stage of the war. So right now they have um, the map power they need for small incremental gains uh, basically, the, the units that, that, that they, they're trying to use uh, to break through are these motorized rifle units uh, made up of largely mobilized personnel um, with insufficient equipment and without armored vehicle support. So we're seeing an increased reliance on these human wave attacks. I'm sure many of you have seen the, those scary images from satellites taking just uh, like World War I style fields littered with the bodies of Russian convicts. Uh, who are just sent, you know, sending bodies and bodies into the fire. Um, that's the Russian way of war right now. Um, you know, human wave attacks, uh, taking very heavy casualties. This can generate small local gains, like the, around Bakhmut, uh, but at very high cost. And these widespread tank losses uh, limit uh, their ability to exploit these breakthroughs. So what, what this means is that um, Russian ground forces are deprived of the ability to exploit any significant breakthrough attempts and Real estate is exchanged in, in yards, meters, not kilometers. The front line just snaps right back like a rubber band. Um, and you know there might be small gains here and there, but unless the Russians are really good at hiding some secret army that uh, we're now aware that they had, um, in terms of theater reserves available for this, it's very limited. Uh, they have maybe one, uh, uh, maybe one motorized rifle division that, that that's uh, the that, 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 that can potentially be employed here that, that is not currently. But overall, if this is the, the extent of the Russian winter offensive, the main risk to Ukraine is attrition, uh, more so than territorial loss. And uh, of course, these, th these things are related. If, uh, if it gets to the point where the, attri the attrition is taking a very heavy toll, Ukraine will have no, cho no choice but to pull back. And it looks like that might happen around Bakhmut. Uh, and they'll, they'll pull back to uh, defensive positions around uh, Krematorsk, and uh, uh, which uh, um, in Slavyansk, which are which are very very well defended positions, uh, so they'll need to potentially trade a little bit of territory f to make sure that they have what it takes to carry out an offensive later on in the, in the spring. Uh, but so far, um, I've not been terribly impressed with what the Russians have been able to marshal. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Yuri. Uh, Kostya, um, you were in Moscow during the full scale invasion. Um, I, I, was, I was I was in Moscow on February 24 and until early March until March 7th. Yeah, so tell us what that was like. Uh, uh, okay, this was I, I mean uh, being in Moscow for the months before the war, it was already quite a depressing experience because I think in Moscow people, uh, were well, not like expecting the war, but they were expecting something bad to happen. So everyone, everyone was depressed. I was trying to basically to write and to speak in support of those who were uh, arrested or the centers that were being closed. I wrote uh, op-eds and Facebook posts about that Russia does not need uh, this war because I thought that there will be a war. I never thought that this might be a bluff, um, a bluff by by Putin after the war started, like some people starting to leave immediately. So like dozens of my friends run to buy uh, tickets 
I remember that we decided to cut our sabbatical and come back, uh, come back to the United States. And we decided that our eight-year-old son, that we're not going to tell him on his last day on, uh, in school, we'll, we'll just take him to the airport after his classes ends. But when he came to school, actually the school was basically uh, like closing down because the director has already departed. Teachers were already in Prague in and um, Georgia. Uh, half of the kids were also leaving. Everyone was crying, so it was like just a total uh, total collapse of his world. Anyways, so I mean, this was uh, initially. I thought that I should not leave Russia. That I should keep trying to stop the train with my bare hands. But then uh, every basically every radio show that I would go, every um, TV station that would interview me every newspaper that would take my column, they were basically all closed, echodoshed, everything was closed, so it didn't make any sense. So when the Russian government criminalized uh, anti-war postings, not only looking forward, but also backward, so you could get uh, prosecuted and people are prosecuted for what they were writing like two years ago, then okay, it was a good time to live. Right, right. Um, so uh, you actually bristled at this question when I uh, suggested it to you in the, before we went on, but I'm going to ask it anyways, and you can bristle ahead. Um, so I, it has occurred to me that, you know, if um, if many were wrong in over predicting the Russia's army success, you know, that you know, people expected the Russian army to um, to uh, take over Ukraine, uh, much more swiftly um, and more successfully than it has, obviously. At the same time, I think um, we were wrong on the other side in terms of Putin's own own resilience. Um, I mean, I think I'm not alone in sort of those who, if, if, if you had told me, I think, at the beginning of 2022, before the full-scale invasion, that Putin would face Iran-style sanctions um, and sort of, you know, battlefield losses that sort of were four times that of Afghanistan, um, you know, massive um, emigration, and including this, the you know, the, the best and the brightest people like you and your friends. I would have expected, you know, maybe not Putin to fall, um, but I might have expected at least to see signs of Putin's power weakening. Um, I mean, in the way that you have actually in Iran, um, and so, you know, why is it that sort of that you know? Do you, do you disagree with the premise that um, Putin is resilient in the face of, of these challenges? Uh, okay, I agree with a lot of what you said, and I disagree with a lot of what you said. So the first thing that we rightly uh, criticize those who were wrong before the, uh, the start of the war, but I think we also need to praise the, a lot of people, including best military analysts who predicted as exactly what was happening. So I'm just sometimes I rereading the tweet that General Mark Hartling uh, made on February 24. Basically, he predicted everything that happened to the Russian army. He predicted uh, the way uh, the Ukrainian army will be resilient, the Russian army will be disorganized. He uh, said basically everything about the insufficient scale, insufficient cause, the uh, commitment, uh, the political strength. And he's not like nobody, he's a military analyst for CNN. So they were mainstream people who were seeing, uh, seeing this right. On the, uh, on the economic, uh, economic resilience, I think the Russian economy is resilient because basically uh, Putin started this like totally unprovoked aggression in a situation in which Russian economy, it was stagnating for a decade, but otherwise it was sort of healthy and this is a rich country and he wasted a lot he wasted a lot of money he wasted a lot of uh lives on this war but russia is a huge and rich country so there is a lot a lot to waste like thinking about a comparison with the afghan war losses i mean i was a teenager when there was the afghan war the thing is that the losses most of the losses were in the early 80s, in the first like three or four years of the war. 
and people start speaking about these losses seven years after the beginning of the war. So it was not like that we saw the reports of um, dead bodies coming from Afghanistan. It was already perestroika and glass list, and people start talking about these uh, casualties. So I'm, I think this is, uh, this is, this will happen. This reckoning, but maybe this will happen later. Like uh, to take a parallel with the World War One, uh, the initial, uh, the initial enthusiasm of the Russian population about World War One was huge. People were basically volunteering to go for the war, and this continued for more than a year. And by, by 1917, the government was like, the whole state was totally collapsed. So I think we'll, in terms of the Putin's government, Putin's regime resilience, we will need to wait for two, maybe three more years. I would bet that he would not survive three years. I, I cannot even imagine, it's like almost improbable that he, that Putin and his like personal regime could survive for three years. Interesting. So you're saying it's still early. That I mean, it's right. That's, like that's still that's still early. R Russia started this war being a very rich and very large uh, and very large country. So there is a lot to waste. Um, I mean, what is your assessment overall of the of the sanctions? I mean, or have they had the kind of immediate? I mean, aside from Putin's regime, I, um, the sanctions. What what is your assessment? I mean, obviously. I, I think we're all strong the, I, supporters of the sanctions. I just want to sort of get your sense of the impact. Okay, on February twenty four, I, I I wrote like when I woke woke up in the morning uh, to the news that Russian uh, troops are already in Ukraine and the Russian um, missiles and bombs are over Ukrainian cities. I wrote that the strength that there will be heavy sanctions and the strength of sanctions will depend on the civilian casualties and the. What will, what will be going on um, in, in Ukraine. I think the sanctions are strong and they're working, but importantly, sanctions are not missiles. You cannot kill a person, you cannot stop a person by economic sanctions. So countries could live under sanctions for decades. The sanctions certainly uh, reduce Putin's ability to wage war, but they cannot, I mean, Again, they're not missiles. They cannot end the war. They just, this is just doing something. This is not the final thing. This is perhaps not most important thing. The most important thing is what the um, Ukrainian army does in Ukraine and what, at what point Russian people will be fed up with what is going on. So these two things are important. Sanctions, they help, but they cannot be the decisive factor. Right. Yuri, um, what's your assessment of uh, of the impact of the sanctions on Russia's war effort? I mean, I know that when we talked last time, you made the point that, uh, you know, the biggest impact was on the sort of high tech, but the Russian army doesn't rely so much on high tech. And, and so maybe, you know, the impact of the sanctions isn't as much as we would hope. Well, it's having a marginal impact on Russia's ability to replace equipment losses. Uh, so th they have a shortage of chips and sensors that they need to replace certain tanks. Uh, it's and, and they're adopting a similar approach they've taken so far in the civilian aviation industry, which is they're cannibalizing older equipment, older vehicles, um, or and even some some new equipment to replace, uh, you know, for, for parts for scrap. Um, there, it's also for them to be creative and looking for for uh, new sources, uh, new de defense imports, uh, Iran, uh, North Korea, uh, People's Republic of China, potentially. Uh, one area that has been relatively unaffected by this, uh, cruise missile production. Uh, uh, so including with the uh, caliber, uh, the high precision missile systems, uh, those, uh, that, that production is going full speed ahead unfortunately, which is terrible news for attacks against Ukraine's critical infrastructure. Uh, the good news is that uh, cruise missiles may are far less destructive uh, than gravity bombs released by aircraft. And right now, Ukraine is doing a pretty good job of implementing an air denial uh, strategy and preventing Russia from having air superiority uh, w w within it, Ukrainian airspace. 
Um, so yeah, so I would say I would say that yeah, the impact has been fairly marginal on on, on Russian uh, war production uh, attrition from. Uh, you know, from Ukrainian forces, uh, destroying a lot of Russian equipment is making a much greater impact than the, than the sanctions ever could. So what, what about, well, you, you mentioned that they've, so they've been unable to replace tanks. Um, you know, that uh, sounds like that's a very, pretty important um, factor in the war right now, at least they're, in, you know, making them unable to sort of take advantage and, and make major advances. Has that been affected at all by the sanctions or is that unrelated? Well, it, it's related, but I would say that the sanctions are not the biggest source of variation in, the, in, in, in their ability to, to, uh, to produce tanks. Uh, you know, a, a lot of the problem is a lot of the, the tanks in Russian stockpiles are not in serviceable condition. They need to be taken out of mothballs. And, um, and there are just basic uh, maintenance issues that have to be overcome that are making at least as big an impact as any kind of shortage of, you know, you know, of, of chips or any, anything else that any other kind of dual use technology that they might import from the West. And they've been, you know, doing what they can to get around it, you know, importing a lot of washing machines to third countries like Kazakhstan. Um, how effective that is, that has been in as a workaround, I, we have yet to see. Uh, but, but so far, it seems like, uh, yeah, the system that are being much less effective are these standoff systems that are going to, be employed independent of ground operations, which can allow Russia to terrorize Ukrainian cities and terrorize the Ukrainian population, but won't be terribly effective in terms of taking ground. So um, do we still, I mean, one of the things that have struck me about, you know, at least surprised me about, you know, the conflict is learning about how much stockpiles had been, you know, of weapons had been, you know, accumulated over such a long period of time. I mean, had, had, it, Am I right in this in sort of interpretation of what you said earlier that they've almost sort of ran out of these stockpiles, or is that wrong? Or... It, it it varies by system. Uh, in, in terms of tanks, uh, yeah, they've lost between a third and a half. Uh, in, in terms of missiles, uh, cruise missiles, uh, I think according to the latest uh, estimates, both from from the from the Brits and from uh, the Ukrainian general staff, uh, they still have about eight tenths. Uh, of of, uh, of their initial stockpile levels, and a lot of that is due to ramped up production. Um, of course, it, it's hard, it's much harder to tell what the, what the stockpiles are with 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 really any of these systems. It's not a very transparent uh, environment in which to do this kind of reporting. Um, but uh, I, I would say I would say that I mean, they do have the advantage of being more self sufficient in terms of defense industrial production than than Ukraine certainly is. Uh, their factories are not within uh, the range of, of, of bombers or missiles, uh, and and they um, and they're not as dependent on imports as, as Ukraine is. Um, but they but they do have some serious problems in terms of the just regular upkeep of, of, of these weapon systems and uh, poor discipline among among the operating crews in terms of being able to take care of these systems and make sure that they're in serviceable condition. All that, of course, is good news uh for for ukraine um but it's uh i mean you should never underestimate russians ability to stumble their way through these things despite key uh you know strategic blunders and and technical shortcomings uh, they will manage to find a way to to see through this uh, one way or the other okay thanks so maybe i'll turn back to the ukrainian side now um oksana and petro so i mean so far you know we, you know, you, you mentioned, you know, uh, Petro, that sort of uh, the fact that we, which we've discussed, which is that, you know, the support for Zelensky obviously shut up dramatically <laughs> uh, before the war and after. And, uh, you know, at least all indications are that, um, that, uh, that, you know, support for you, uh, Zelensky is quite high, which obviously helps in the war effort. I mean, uh, I'll start with you, Oksana. I mean, what's your sense of, you know, civil society? Is it, you know, willing to support? Uh, Zelensky so forever or you, despite sort of, you know, I mean, it's been easy so far because, you know, there have been you know, significant battlefield successes, which always makes, you know, it's always, you know, increases support for government. But let's let's imagine a scenario in which, you know, the battle lines are drawn and you sort of there's sort of more of a kind of frozen conflict style, you know, situation. I mean, what do you foresee in terms of, you know, public support for the government? 
or you know, um, so. maybe about the numbers and public support this will be the question rather to Petro uh, yeah. but what I would like to address this is the uh, critical uh, approach and estimation of the society around uh, corruption issues legitimacy and trust so we have this very um, interesting or unique situation in Ukraine where uh, due to martial law many transparency mechanisms and accountability mechanisms they were um, shut down in fact so all the open data that Ukraine was progressing on um, is not available then there are no elections there are several accountability mechanisms to displace uh, to um, yeah to display some um, authorities on the local level they are also not working there is uh, no possibility to protest but nevertheless uh, the uh, trust in the society to the authorities is very high especially to those uh, that are responsible for uh, security uh, nevertheless i see in the discussions a very critical attitude towards the issues of corruption and pushing for reforms such as judiciary reforms and we also see exceptionally um, high or intensive response from the authorities so that for the first time uh, for example we see things like the oligarchization in action in fact so there is not only the law which is already quite groundbreaking for the oligarchization but there was in november for example a decision made that enabled um taking and using assets uh, of oligarchs and uh, providing this uh, money that are um, taking from corrupt transactions to the army and this is what uh, independent anti-corruption authorities are doing now there is also um, a lot of discussion or um, yeah uh, in the west especially or a low trust like let's see whether there is not, not a game, a game like, uh, for example, Kuchma or Yanukovych were playing to dismiss the opposition or uh, the people who are not convenient to Zelensky. But um, in difference to that time, uh, the anti-corruption became uh, conducted institutionally. So under Kuchma or Yanukovych who misused anti-corruption policies, for this very purposeful um, and selective uh, hunting for opposition. Now this is done not by the president himself, but by independent anti-corruption authorities. And this independency, this is given by the selection process of the heads and creation of the uh, authorities, because civil society and international partners, they having, um, a large influence and uh, a voice in the decisions who is appointed and they also can uh, have the oversight and control uh, in terms of integrity people who are applying for the high positions for anti-corruption authorities and these authorities that were created they are responsible for prevention corruption and also investigation uh, of corruption and uh, there is a special anti-corruption court and this is not something new through the war, but already before the war, we saw that um, the machine started working so that this uh, all ensemble of anti-corruption institutions, it started working and prosecuting high corruption cases. And here comes also the link to the security because 2020 when uh, high anti-corruption court started producing first um, decisions uh, we saw the constitutional crisis especially people who had some conflict of interest and were related to Russia in the constitutional court they uh, kind of started to hijacking these um, institutions anyway there was also a resistance from the parliament so there was this contingency but what happened in the war that the political will was kind of reassessed <laughs> and uh, reinforced to uh, let these reforms happen and to let this uh, anti-corruption prosecutions proceed because authorities understand that uh, like never before they need society to, so to solve the crisis different crises uh, that were created um, 
they need the trust of the Western partners also. And to provide it, they cannot allow themselves to have uh, corruption scandals, especially in the sector of defense, but also in other issues. And so we see in the last weeks, um, very historically, this is quite exceptional situation for Ukraine, where people are really dismissed also for image um, concerns, because the authorities cannot allow themselves to have uh, the scandals around. And I think if uh, this will continue and go on, uh, this is a positive effect that we see in the society. And there are still um, enough watchdogs who are carefully doing their work and controlling uh, all the new appointments and also um, the processes behind all this and the corruption things. Interesting. Cases. <laughs> Certainly, if, if, if there's... In if there ever was, there was definitely an impetus to sort of carry out this kind of anti-corruption work that you've been studying. Um, Petros, do you want to answer the question about um, popular support for Zelensky? I mean, is this something, I mean, I mean, I assume it's partly contingent on the sort of things that sort of Oksana was talking about, you know, people's perception of corruption. Um, but where do you see it going? I mean, it... Um, well, no. First, first, I don't think that it depends somehow on corruption. Okay. Uh, uh, people are really uh, and were really uh, dissatisfied and angered when they heard about this corruption. But uh, fortunately for the president, he reacted very swiftly and in a smart way. So he addressed the cause of the corruption and he removed. He not only uh, wanted to remove the uh, those who. Uh, allegedly, allegedly committed this, uh, but he also uh, ordered to uh, investigate uh, this. So, uh, and this was swift. Uh, just to tell you that the paper, uh, the article uh, was published on Friday, and on Monday they were fired. So it's a uh, it's a uh, rocket speed uh, in the Ukrainian politics. But uh, this issue is not a critical and a key for understanding what's going on in Ukraine and with uh, Zelensky. Uh, I don't think that uh, this can rock uh, his positions. Uh, how I see is that, uh, as, as you mentioned, so let us imagine that uh, nothing changes and it looked like not a frozen conflict, but a, uh, as I uh, saw in uh, in some Western publications, like it's a, a standoff, it's a deadlock, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that we should think about some kind of Korean type uh, ceasefire. Uh, uh, well, I think that even, um, I, I don't think that it, it depends on Zelensky. Uh, it depends on two things. First, it depends on the Putin's plan. Uh, how, if he, if he decides that, uh, uh, this is an acceptable exit from the war, then uh, it's one situation. And the second situation is the scale uh, and, and, the, and the tempo of the Western uh, supplies to Ukraine, as uh, Mr. Zhukov said. But I just want to tell you one thing, that uh, in December uh, last year, in 2022, we asked people a question during the poll. So uh, what uh, actions of the government would you support if the Western uh, military and economic support is uh, reduced or stopped at all. And 50%, uh, it's remarkable, 50% of the people said that the government should continue fight as nothing happened. 50% of the population. Another, another 15%, like 14.5, said that uh, maybe the government should uh, try to freeze conflict, but without accepting any kind of Russian suggestions for the peace, meaning that includes so-called Korean type ceasefire. And the explanation is the only one uh, that despite, despite the Western help, whether it will be reduced or accelerated, the war, the Ukrainians will continue the war. Um, the main reason is the crimes committed by Russians. And, and their intention, they, they clearly showed their intention to kill everybody. And that was understood very well. So uh, in my impression that uh, 
the war will continue until uh, all Russian soldiers are killed. And while it, New York New York Times uh, today uh, yesterday uh, published uh, some kind of report, I don't know some from some from where that Putin can uh, draft another hundreds of thousand people. Uh, but uh, listen, uh, Ukraine uh, also can uh, uh, mobilize uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of people, and that will be a new, kindly new stage of the war. And uh, uh, moreover, uh, in my in my impression, that uh, if the West accelerates and increases and uh, gives everything that Ukrainian government asks, that will increase the chances for their fast peace. Because uh, uh, the longer war takes, the more anger will grow inside the Ukrainian society and the war will not stop on the Ukrainian borders. And the Ukrainian army would enter the Russian territory or the Ukrainian groups would enter the Russian territory if the war, uh, uh, if the war continues after 2023, this war will continue on the Russian territory. I don't speak that Ukrainian army or troops will uh, attack the Russian civilian objects. No, but many Russian military objects would be attacked inside Russia. In a, in a way, uh, uh, so, um, and returning back to, to your question, I think that uh, the uh, rating of the president or his support uh, will depend on, uh, on the ability to um, to manage to get as much Western aid as possible and ability to uh, somehow to conduct the war uh, when uh, the uh, Russian actual uh, casualties are high and keeping the uh, Ukrainian casualties low. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, I think this year uh, Zelensky would face a very tough choice whether to continue the war in this way like we see it when we have uh, peaceful cities uh, if you go right, right now on the street tonight on the street, you will see a lot of people uh, in cafes or in uh, shops. Or we have lights here, uh, but this year uh, the government would have to uh, maybe to um, to implement a kind of uh, Israel type uh, all uh, societies mobilization in order to win this war and to suggest that uh, Ukraine is serious about fighting Russia. Because from the Ukrainian perspective, it seems like that the sequence of giving Ukrainian arms, it's not a, a help to Ukraine, it's a dialogue with Putin. So uh, would you agree, like they, they are saying, would you agree to, we say to Putin, would you agree to this kind of line of the ceasefire? No, then we are giving uh, tanks to Ukrainians. Are you ready now for the peace talks? No, then we will give Ukrainians uh, warplanes and modern jets. That's how it looks like. And, and that's why I think Putin is continuing the war because he still thinks that uh, the war depends on the Western aid, not on the decisiveness of the Ukrainian authorities. Right. Uh, so let's uh, maybe turn to you, uh, Kostya, sort of, if you can sort of, we'll end by kind of speculating a bit on sort of how this conflict might end. I think um, all of us, you know, agree that sort of, I mean, please tell me if not, but I mean, all of us agree that sort of obviously negotiating with Putin right now is, is totally, totally pointless and, and sort of, uh the road to peace is is through military victory um but i'm just wondering sort of um i mean cost do you agree that sort of the, the ultimately this war only ends when putin is out uh yes and no i i, I basically agree with this that putin putin's being out is is a good way to end the hostilities and i'm pretty sure that any government Anyone who would replace Putin, even if it's a right-wing military coup, um, I don't know, establishment coup like the Khrushchev Oster, or I don't know, a popular revolution, any new government would, would stop hostilities, withdraw Russian troops from the newly occupied territories, or perhaps from major parts of the newly occupied territories, and start negotiations. What happens after that, I don't know, but I think that the collapse of the Putin's regime is like the the best and the most probable way how this the current situation the current situation ends. Still, I think Putin like person his his role is strong enough that he could 
withdraw troops from the newly occupied territory and survive the way um, Saddam Hussein withdrew his troops from, I mean, his troops were destroyed in, in Iraq during the Gulf War in 1991, and he still remained in power. So I think it's possible. I think if uh, Russia loses in a, in, on a minute on a battlefield, loses Crimea and Donetsk and Luhansk, as well, then Putin wouldn't be able to survive this. But overall, yes, it's basically Putin's war. And until the regime collapses, they will try to continue. Um, do you agree with that, Yuri? Or? Largely, yes. Um, unfortunately, wars do not end with the complete decimation of one size forces. Uh, statistically, uh, most countries, uh, when so when war ending agreements are reached, uh, still have a, a sizable chunk of their force that are, that are capable of continuing to fight. The same thing was true even in Germany in 1945. A third of the Wehrmacht was still intact and they could have continued to resist. Ultimately, it will come down to a negotiation, but this is a negotiation that uh, Ukraine should approach from unassailable strength. Uh, they're not there yet. Um, and uh, and what it will take to get there, um, certainly at a minimum, a severing of the land bridge to Crimea, Zaporizhia. Um, Crimea will be tough. Um, and of course, the, the more Putin has his back against the wall, um, the more likely it is that he will lash out in unpredictable ways. And so there's a risk to that. But uh, that risk uh, needs to be weighed against the greater risk of, of of either a prolonged stalemate or a decisive victory in Ukraine. I mean, Ukraine can certainly continue to fight without without Western support, but it will be a very different kind of war, and it will be not one that will will end up with uh, any clear benefits uh, for Ukrainian society. This is a this is one that needs to be uh, backed uh, as much as possible by the West, and um, and the main question is whether we have uh, the will. In the West, and 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 the capability of the defense industrial production to give Ukraine what it needs. So I'll, I'll maybe I'll, I'll take it there. I mean, certainly the well. I mean, I I have to say I've been surprised. I've talked about this in this webinar um, about the sort of strength of the the Western will. I think you know many of us worried early in the conflict in March or so that that there was sort of emerged kind of Ukraine fatigue. Um, you know that that was kind of my assumption. You know, from other conflicts initially, sort of people are, you know worried and about you know pay a lot of attention to a certain conflict but that um they eventually lose interest but you don't really see that you know so far i mean it's remarkable after one year you know first of all ukraine is i mean by, by the measure of the new york times which is obviously non-scientific you know it's certainly covered as much on the front page or nearly as much as it was from you know the first couple months um and if anything, Western resolve is greater in some ways than it was in March, because in March you had Macron and 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 Schultz sort of really talking very seriously about negotiating with Putin. Um, but it definitely feels that sort of people, you know, at least the major Western leaders, you know, people like Orban aside, have sort of given that up. <laughs> at least I don't really hear that nearly as much. And there's a sort of a recognition that the sort of the the, the nearest path to, to peace is through military victory. Um, not to mention the fact that sort of uh, Germany, I mean, people criticize Germany, but it has, you know, you know, in the space of just a year, you know, dramatically cut its, its supplies to, uh, you know, Russian gas. So I guess I'm just going to throw this open and whoever wants to jump in, um, you know, how, do you see this will continuing? I mean, assume, you know, Let's assume for the moment that there, I mean, isn't sort of a dramatic uh, Ukrainian advances on the battlefield. Let's assume a sort of a kind of a stalemate time situation. Do, do, do you see um, maybe uh, who wants to take this first? Where do you see Russia, uh, Western will? Is it going to be sort of stay with us? Is it going to be resilient? Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, okay. I, I, I do not think that there are any problems with the. Uh, with the Western will, I think that uh, 
the Western governments, including the American government, would have supported Ukraine even with a much lower uh, lower pub public support. So the whole idea is that you need to have like 60 or even 50 percent of public support for a uh, for a for a, for a certain policy transferring arms. This has never been the case. The United States supported a lot of regimes despite being being unpopular unpopular policies. So this is actually and this is actually like incredibly high level of support. So like the American isolationists who are historically strong this time they are uh, at their weakest point. So like compared even to um, the years before World War II, isolationists were far stronger than uh, than now. Also, I think uh, what's important from for a political for a political economist that um, the basically the American politics, the elites even in the Republican Party, they are very much aligned on all these goals with the Democratic with the Democratic Party, and certainly you know it's always good to have like the military industrial complex on your side as a lobby. I mean. It's like a positive assessment, but they have huge lobbying power. And whatever you say about military aid to Ukraine, every military aid is actually money being paid to American contractors. So this is like, I would say that this is a safe base to proceed. So if I, I, would, I would not consider uh, Western support a major risk factor. There are a lot of other risk factors things could go unexpected on the battlefield. There might be, I don't know, a rise of new, I don't know, pro-Russian leader in Ukraine. This is inconceivable, but I would say that uh, like a fall of Western support, a disintegration of Western support, I think it's a far, dis far more distant risk than other risks. Justin, anybody else? Yeah. yeah. So I am concerned that Ukraine is becoming an increasingly partisan issue in U.S. domestic politics. Um, and while Kostya is right that the mainstream view in the in the Republican Party, as articulated by folks like Mitch McConnell, is to strongly back Ukraine, that is not what the base of the Republican Party is at all. If you just listen to conservative talk radio, if you listen, if you read some of the more uh, MAGA uh, publications, such as American Greatness, uh, you see a constant reiteration of Kremlin talking points. You see a view that Ukraine is Biden's pet project, that it, Zelensky is corrupt, that they did not back Trump during the first impeachment, and that there's some vindictiveness there. And uh, the momentum in terms of U.S. public opinion on this is unfortunately uh, in, right now in the direction of less support than more. I, I agree that there's still a critical mass of support that's there, but this is an issue that will be almost certainly demagogued in the next round of presidential elections. Um, and uh, I think it will, it, will it will take some loud voices, not just from folks like Mitch McConnell, but from folks on the MAGA right uh, in, in order to, to buck up the support. Because right now, if you, if you fly a Ukrainian flag in, in, in certain communities, if, even here in the Midwest, you get yelled at. Uh, as being un-American. Why, why are you flying a foreign country's flag and not, and our, not our flag? This is not our war. Um, that's not a new development in U.S. politics. I mean, there was the America First movement before World, World War II that was quite uh, quite active. Uh, but, uh, but there has not been a unifying event such as a Pearl Harbor, that had, that, which was the original event that made uh, the, the American First Movement kind of go fade into the background and made folks at like Gerald Ford distance themselves from the other. Um, yeah, so I, I, I'm a little bit more worried, but, uh, but, but, but I see, see the question might have a, have, have a reaction here as well. Too. But I just want to actually though, follow up you know, on, Cl on Cluster's point about the, uh, which has struck me as well. I mean, there's a definite sort of material component um, which is always helpful in terms of orange production. I mean, doesn't this sort of undercut some of the isolationists or what do you think of that? Um, I, 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 want, I, want, I wanted to add one thing is that yeah. I actually think that it's sort of uh, paradoxical, but the current uh, polarization of US politics, it sort of helps Ukraine 
because basically Republicans uh, who control the House of Representatives, they have almost nothing to compromise with the Democrats about. Nothing but the uh, Pentagon's budget. And this was like a hallmark of the second term of President Obama when Republicans were controlling Congress. Basically, there were a lot of government stalemate. There were no many, not much reforms, basically. And President Obama was doing executive orders. So this was like a total conflict. And every year they would come together on one issue to increase the Pentagon budget. And in this particular situation, in this uh, way the United States is helping Ukraine, I think this is a kind of, this, this is what is going to be happening. I could imagine that Republicans in the Congress, they will cut on the humanitarian aid to Ukraine, but this is actually small. And they would at the same time increase the Pentagon's, Pentagon's budget, which is what, what matters. Go ahead, Yuri. I would jump in. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Do you want to break it? Sorry. <laughs> Oksana. No, because I have some uh, doubts also and concerns about uh, the long-term support uh, in the Western Europe, uh, especially as elections will be upcoming, so on the term of uh, three to five years, because uh, Russia still has a lot of subtle influence on political parties, especially extreme right, extreme left in Western Europe. And they are successful in lobbying uh, Russian interests. Like what is going on in Germany right now in the narrative, there is a boom around this uh, idea that uh, weapon uh, proliferation, uh, weapon um, support to Ukraine is uh, not sustainable or not supported and many people uh, fall into this trap. And uh, this is mainly propagated by the uh, far left and far right who united in this issue. And if we see the recent elections in uh, France, in Italy, in Germany as well, uh, far right is becoming very strong and they are uh, very explicitly supporting Russia. So um, I really have my doubts because I feel that also in Western Europe, there is no this recognition that economic interest is also a security issue. So they still keeping this, um, thinking of, okay, we have economic connections uh, or some interests, but let's keep it a part of security and safety, which is uh, something very different. And this is undermining uh, the politics in uh, the Western European countries. So where I see rather opportunities on the long term in Ukraine, this is really the joint ventures uh, to um, create and produce weapons by Ukrainian companies. And Ukraine has actually a very strong defense uh, and security industry. And what was positive just before the war, it undergone um, a reform that uh, also changed the legal status from this um, late Soviet uh, or uh, from the Soviet type of Ukrobaron Prom having this umbrella that unites all the uh, companies and they cannot do anything. So they undergone uh, a very careful audit uh, and also changed the legal person of those companies uh, that are actually able now to work with Western companies and produce uh, weapons. So I think this is where things or opportunities are open. And what I read also that some countries, they are taking advantage of it and already engaging in negotiations to collaborate uh, on the private uh, sector, like in the private section without engagement uh, of politics. Although, I mean, can I just uh, maybe press you on this a little bit? I mean, I, um, I'm, you know, I definitely agree with you on the sort of, you know, red-brown coalition of you know, the far right, far left. You, you, need, you need an optimistic take of European support uh, to Ukraine. Yeah, I could optimistic take take yes first uh, but this is oh, wait, wait, I, I just want, I want to, sorry i just want to follow up with oksana um so but uh, italy which is you know your employment right it's university of bologna the the fascist you know before she came to power the proto i don't know what you call her um you know everybody expected her to sort of be a russian stooge or you know be much more anti-ukrainian she's thankfully not 
done that. I mean, is there any hope in that, or is she kind of uh, that you know that the far right when they actually come to power um, will end up being more pro-Ukrainian um, than we would, hope, we would think? What, what are your what is your thought? But specifically in, with Italy, indeed, uh, the concerns were uh, bigger than they came true. Uh, but I think in other countries, this is the um, yeah. other story. Okay, great. Um, Yuri, do you want to? Um, I think we have to wrap it up soon. Do you want to go ahead? I mean, sorry, um, sorry, um, Kostya. I can't hear you. You mean optimistic take on Western support? Sure, whatever you. <laughs> Or you, yeah. cynical, do not quote me on this. Uh, the US support matters of the first order, whatever happens in Western Europe is of the second order. So this is a kind of a secondary question. The other, the other reason why I'm, why I'm optimistic is that countries that are bordering Ukraine or Russia, like Poland, Sweden, uh, Finland, Baltic countries, Czech Republic, these countries, they uh, there is like a total national recognition that they are in the same um, that they have the same fate as Ukraine. They would never leave, leave Ukraine. So I could uh, I could more easily imagine a scenario in which Ukraine is overtaken by like Kiev is taken by Russian tanks, and then Pol Pol Poland and Finland send their troops to actually defend U Ukraine there. In this case, there will be no NATO obligations because this will not be defensive. But I could imagine like Poland, re Polish regular army defending Ukraine more than Poland abandoning Ukraine. And I think that what we're, what we're seeing in Germany, it's sort of, uh, there are a lot of people, including the, like the establishment and top leadership, who are sort of pro-Russia, but I think they are, um, they're sort of permanently anti-Putin. They sort of, um, like they ended their hopes that there will be some settlement with Putin. And this is like, this is enough for Ukraine to continue to receive support. Okay. Okay, I think we'll wrap it up there. Um, thank you, uh, Kostya. Thank you, Yuri. Thank you, Petro. Thank you, Oksana. Um, and uh, uh, just we'll be having uh, sessions in, in the next few weeks um, on deportations um, from from Ukraine to Russia, um, as well as some other uh, some other events. So please stay tuned. So thank you so much. Bye bye.